Good evening. Welcome to all of you. Given, well, even if our topic wasn't religion, politics, and peacemaking, it would still be appropriate for us to begin tonight with a moment of silence. But given the fact that we are focusing on religion and politics and peacemaking, and that this past weekend we had yet another tragic massacre of innocent people, this one at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I believe we should pause, have a moment of silence, remember those victims and the victims of so many massacres that we've had in recent history. Well, welcome back to those of you who were here earlier today, and welcome to all of you who are coming for the first time to this conference uh, this evening. You're all welcome to this 31st Annual Peace Studies Conference, sponsored by the Peace Studies Department here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, and this year uh, also by the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning, which I have the, the pleasure and honor to be directing. The um, conference, as I said, it's titled Religion, Politics, and Peacemaking. Subtitle, you may have seen, Perspectives from Hagazian University, Lebanon, and the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University here in Minnesota. The genesis for this particular conference began in a conversation between our professor, John Armajani, professor of theology here, who also teaches peace studies classes, um, and Dr. Paul Hadostian, right here, the president of Hagazian University in Lebanon. They go way back to their Princeton days when they were both pursuing degrees there. And the last, um, the last six years, right, John? Yeah, yeah. The last six years, John has pursued research um, in the Middle East, basing himself in Lebanon, in Beirut, and more particularly, right at Hagazian University, given the gracious hospitality of Dr. Hadostian and others there. And so, a number of years ago, they conceived a conference that was held in Beirut that the J. Phillips Center here was a co-sponsor for, and um, we are happy to uh, return the hospitality and, and now have the delegation from uh, Hagazian that, has that is participating today. We had two speakers uh, earlier today, Sua Naimi um, and Wilbert Von Sane, uh, who teach there, and now Dr. Hadostian, who is president there but is a scholar of religion like our own president, Mary Hinton. Before I um, say a few more words about each of the uh, participants tonight, um, I do, sitting right here, because we have our third president here too, uh, uh, Michael Hemisath, who's, who's our moderator. I just want to say how grateful I am uh, to John and to Paul, to the two of you, for conceiving this and um, John for bringing this idea to me and then we shared it with the Peace Studies people who enthusiastically embraced it. And so I'm, I'm grateful to John, I'm grateful to uh, Jeff Anderson, uh, Dr. Anderson over there, uh, who is chair of the Peace Studies department and uh, to Sheila Hellerman, the administrative assistant or coordinator for that department who did so much work in helping to organize this. And I really also am happy to express gratitude to Jeff Wubbles and uh, Noah Rachie who uh, are always so hospitable uh, for all the programs we hold and um, have been especially uh, hospitable, again, uh, hospitable again this time. 
So, Dr. Paul Hadostian, the Reverend Dr. Paul Hadostian, um, he is the president of Agassian University, a position he has held since 2002. So he's the longest reign, reigning president here. By a long shot. Yeah. <laughs> he earned a Master's of Divinity from the Near East School of Theology in Beirut, where he grew up. He then earned a Master's in Theology uh, and a PhD at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, where he lived for six and a half years. Those two degrees, one could live even longer than that, but you, you did it in a good amount of time. Um, and so he's lived in Lebanon all his life and New Jersey. And, <laughs> and we're happy to have you here. We're happy to have you here again, because four years ago, uh, the J. Philip Center sponsored him uh, in a lecture and in a very enlightening lecture uh, that you presented in March of 2014. It's great to have you back. Um, he's the author of numerous articles published in Ar um, um, uh, Armenian and Arabic and English. Probably nobody else here has duplicated that. Um, He's the chair of the Central Committee of the Union of Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East, and he holds leadership positions in ecclesiastical and educational and ecumenical organizations um, in the Mideast and beyond. Dr. Mary Hinton, president of the College of St. Benedict since 2014. Dr. Hinton received her BA degree from Williams College her MA uh, degree in clinical child psychology from the University of Kansas City, and a PhD in religion and religious education from Fordham University in New York, and she received that degree with high honors. None of us here are surprised by that. <laughs> Dr. Hinton's scholarly interests include African American religious history, religious education, and leadership, as well as strategic planning and diversity in the academy. And she's doing so much uh, wonderful work now uh, focusing on inclusion in the, in the academy. And um, Dr. Hinton is the author of the book, The Commercial Church, Black Churches and the New Religious Marketplace in America. Dr. Michael Hemesath is president of St. John's University, a position he has held since 2012. Dr. Hemesath is the first lay person appointed uh, to a full presidential term here at St. John's University. In 1981, he, w he graduated from St. John's University, majoring in economics, and he received his BA here, summa cum laude. After that, he went on and received uh, an MA and PhD in economics at Harvard University. From 1989 until 2012, Dr. Hemesath was on the faculty at Carleton College, and he has served as faculty president there for the last three years of his term. It's a great honor to have these uh, uh, presidents participating in this conference. And it's a joy uh, for Dr. Anderson and for myself um, and others who have been uh, planning this to uh, have as our keynote, uh, our keynote session of this conference to have it as a presidential session. So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Michael uh, Hemesack. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you for uh, your efforts in putting this event together. Uh, and thanks to the Peace Studies Department for the 31st year of the Peace Studies uh, Conference, which has brought uh, speakers from all over the country and all over the world to St. Ben's and St. John's to talk about issues uh, of importance to these communities and to the broader world. Um, looking at the topics tonight, religion, politics, and peacemaking, it's clear that we didn't lack for ambition in trying to address uh, these topics tonight. Um, any one of those, I think, would have been sufficient, but three 
I'm glad I'm just moderating and not having to speak. Um, tonight we have, we'll have two uh, presentations by our, uh, our panelists. Uh, Dr. Hadosian will speak about education for preventing religious extremism and nurturing peaceful relations. Uh, and Dr. Hinton will speak about cultivating inclusive, inclusive and peaceful communities, uh, multi-faith sources for inspiration. Uh, I think they both recognize that in the world that we're living in today, uh, we're, we're all looking for a little bit of hope around these topics, and I think that tonight uh, the two of them will offer that uh, perspective for us. Um, I hope that's not putting too much pressure on you. Um, we'll try. Good. I, I have no doubt. Um, there'll be a question and answer session to follow. Um, the microphone's on either side, which you're more than welcome to come up and uh, ask a question. In fact, that, that's the preferred option if you're willing to do so, but if you'd rather uh, write questions down in a card and deliver them up here, I will do my best to decipher your handwriting and uh, query the uh, panelists based on the questions you might offer. So with no further ado, I don't think that I guess we didn't decide who was going first. Is our guest from Lebanon going first? Dr. Dosian, please. Thank you. President Tamasat, President Hinton, directors of the J. Phillips Center and the Peace Studies Department, dear friends, uh, this is really uh, a great honor to be with you all uh, tonight and throughout the day. And it has been very meaningful to be related to your universities. Uh, so thank you, thank you again. So let me start my topic. A homiletics professor Years ago, it wasn't at the seminary, but years ago, a homiletics professor warned us that we should avoid speaking on such topics as peace and love, as they are themes about which everything and anything may make some sense, and at the same time, our speech about them may sound useless and really ineffective. Anyway, let us dare today to disobey, to unpack some ideas about peace, so first, some perspectives on my personal background I thought I should share. As I came to define those perspectives and myself, where I really felt the absence of peace all around me. The absence of peace around me. See, in the following three instances, how necessary and difficult it was for me to imagine peace. Three instances. From my childhood to teenage years, I had already learned that we, while being ethnically Armenian, lived in Lebanon, in an Arab country. Why? Because during and after the World War I, the vast majority of the Armenians in Cilicia, Anatolia, the various parts of Turkey and Armenia, had either been massacred or deported into the deserts of Syria or other neighboring lands. This meant that our identity and history as Armenians in the diaspora had a distinct and thick filter from homeland, where we were about 100 years ago, from homeland into Neverland, into other land, into new land, different types of lands. If the past was marked by war and genocide during World War I for us, the present, when I was a child and teenager, implied the lack of peace with things, places, memories, and people of an Armenian past. As a result, much was being or was to be reconstructed for us. So that's the first instance. Second. Living in Lebanon, an Arab country, we learned very early on that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict put us all in a state of war so that mini wars or mega wars could erupt any moment. We learned to really expect war, not only to have it as a possibility. During my lifetime, this actually came true many times in many, in many forms. The third instance, as Lebanon had witnessed 
local civil wars of its various religious sects and their armed men in the 19th and 20th centuries. A devastating one also erupted when I was 13, a new civil war in Lebanon, and only ended as I had reached my years of doctoral studies. So you can imagine, about 15 to 16 years. During those years, that is my, basically my teenage years and youth, daily life, hour by hour, was a toiling exercise of avoiding danger. So I, I, I could really present this for hours, uh, different instances, but let's take the totality of it. So three different instances of the lack really of peace. Imagine then that as a result of these factors, my ethnic belonging was in a state of war with a country, Turkey, that had enjoyed impunity for long decades and did not even recognize something called genocide it had committed. So this was a conflict in me and in many others, a conflict with memory and global injustice and could not even find, find the front, the demarcation line on which I or others could try to fight or sol solve matters. Where is this war? There's something called war. Uh, it was there, it's still in us, but which one is its front? Now, the country, my country, Lebanon, was divided across Christian Muslim lines, mostly in aggressive ways, as I said. The synonym of the whole Middle East region where we lived, my region, was terror and turmoil. As I was growing up, and actually in 1987, when I came here to the USA to study, the minute I said Middle East, I knew what bell was ringing in people's minds. I, I mean, it didn't need too much thinking people knew this was something terrorizing or war. As you can see, it was very natural for us to learn not to expect peace around us. And probably, I mean, dear my young friends, dear students, I hope you'll take this down because this is something very serious. To grow up, to, lear to learn not to expect any peace. This is a very serious matter. My case is not unique to our region, nor is it to other areas or societies of the world. It is just that we have been more known for it, more intensively, for a very long time. Upon reflection, I have realized that peace the message and example of peace I had mainly learned in a few places. Peace or its message I had learned at home, at church, at school. And in severe contrast, the lack of peace, the opposite of peace, whatever it was, I had witnessed in repeated actions or in dangerous potentials all around us. What I believe sustained me, which is an important question, what I believe sustained me as a youth is that I had first learned to expect goodness of life and goodness of being before learning anything else. I had first learned to expect goodness of life and goodness of being within, of course, in our case, within my, our Christian frame, framework of faith. Maybe a luxury not afforded by all or granted to all. Clearly, education for peace, if faithfully launched in early ages of human beings, gives the generous opportunity for raising a generation of those who look for peace and those who want to work for peace or make peace. Then peace is created at least somewhere, if not out there, then in here. It's created somewhere and may function as a yeast for more peace with others elsewhere. When the Lebanese war started in 1975 and the city of Beirut was divided into a Christian East Beirut and a Muslim West Beirut, we lived in the northern besieged city of Tripoli where the war was less severe. And as a family, we listened every evening to Radio Monte Carlo's Arabic news service out of France. It gave a daily account about the war in Beirut, the way it had started, the first 
months of the civil war. So it counted the dead in Beirut, especially in the inner center of Beirut. In some days, I remember, it was 125 dead, others 140, 200, every day in a relatively small downtown. As a 13-year-old who was interested in political and global issues, I remember listening to Mon Radio Monte Carlo saying to my father the following innocent thing. I would say, if only the United Nations heard about this, they would surely intervene and stop the killing. When I was 13, I had just learned about these international organizations. So my view was that they haven't heard about this. Once they hear about this, it's impossible for them not to do anything. The idealistic me and the cold it. By the way, I have always been intrigued by the fact that the antonym of idealistic is realistic. It's a problem. Anyway, let me go on. Soon after, I started witnessing killings. This is 1975-76. Killings on the streets and kidnappings in front of our res residence. In one instance, I watched a group of armed men, three or four, I'm not sure, in a Mercedes limousine. I still can, can imagine. These people who put their masks in our yard on their faces and went and kidnapped and allegedly killed one of our neighbors. A few days later, the mutilated body was found in a river and I, as a 13, 14 year old, wanted to go to the funeral, which is not typical. And I don't know why I wanted to walk in the procession of that funeral because people, you know, uh, carrying the casket would move from uh, the home to the church and then to the cemetery and so on and I wanted to walk with hundreds of others and there were some of the kidnappers among the mourners and people knew it but were afraid to talk. My idealistic views on human dignity, peace, integrity and kindness were being shattered. Here's another important line I think for us to remember. I was disappointed with human nature. I was disappointed with human nature. I remember saying, this is not the world I would like to live in. Notice that I was not disappointed with the other groups. I was not disappointed with opposing groups. I was not disappointed with evil people out there, but with human nature as the evil ones committed the crime and the gentle ones looked the other way. Not many Samaritans around. Let me repeat. I was disappointed with human nature. Today, I'm glad I was disappointed with human nature and not with the other people I don't like, the other people that I considered evil. I now say that provid providentially, my disappointed disappointment was basically, with human nature. Maybe that opened a theological window for me in adult life to seek grace. And not simply, and not simply or self-righteously take sides on this issue or the other and try to see who is my enemy. The frame of peace had to be bigger and its reach deeper. I knew our task was to reconstruct hope in life and among humans. Let me move on now, enough of that, of those uh, difficult stories really. Let me move on to some more general remarks. As we all are commissioned to be makers of peace and educators for peace. A general notion of education for peace often sounds too impractical and undermined but what may actually happen in conditions or instances in real life or on the ground. You may plant the seed and someone may rob it, step on it, or choke it. In most instances, we may not see the fruits of peace planting anyway. So why bother educate? Why bother educate for peace? One realizes that it is not possible to work for peace, to prepare for peace, and to build peace without telling about it, teaching about it at multiple layers, levels as education is not a neutral or tasteless endeavor. 
It is meant for humans to develop in a balanced manner, to learn to change, to interact properly, to create and give enthusiastically. Some facts are known, but let me repeat. That peace is not the absence of war. This is one clear point. Peace is not the absence of war. In 1987, when I first moved to study in the USA, a number of friends here said, it is good you have left Lebanon, the war situation there. I remember I responded by saying that didn't sound right to many. I responded by saying that it did not mean that I was at peace here in the USA. Some people thought that was not gracious of me. I should have been grateful that I had left a situation of war and come to a country of peace. And yet I said, yes, I left the war there, but doesn't mean I have peace here. They may have thought I was being cynical or philosophical. In fact, my description was that of my heart. Another fact is that peace is not a magical accomplishment or automatically established. The conflict of interests and conditions, the conflict of interests and conditions, the fallenness of egos and immature ambitions will always clash and they need to be disciplined if not tamed. Peace is always the result of effort. Peace is not the most attractive news, this you also know nor the most sensational accomplishment. Peace as such is considered to be dull news, unless it follows major conflicts of breaking news. And then its attraction will last for a very short time, the news of peace. For many years now, Lebanon has been enjoying peace on many fronts, and yet the old and repeated news persist and create greater interest than peace. Lebanon has been enjoying peace for quite uh, some years now, and yet when we think about it, people want to remember it as a, a negative war place. Education that lays the foundation for peace is one of the key responses to conflict, war, and division. Education for peace is not the only option, as one needs local laws, information sharing, communication, NGOs, non-politicized think tanks, international efforts, international standards, judicial systems, accountability on the part of many, deterrence systems, among others. Education for peace has mainly the human beings in mind as agents and as owners. Education for peace has human beings in mind, person by person. More than persons who have peace as an ideology or a profession, we are in need of peaceful people who can create peace with others, among others, and for others. Let me repeat this, my dear friends, especially my dear young friends, don't think about peace as a profession, don't think about it as an ideology. It is education, it is learning, it is giving, it is to, to be created anew within us, so that we may spread the same news and the peace with others. One peaceful and peacemaking person may accomplish more than tens of my lectures on peace. If my lectures are not able to impact the personality of the learner and move them into more peaceful existence. So peace is not a technique, it is a quality of living and being. Let me dare say that if peace does not start, does not start at home, the task of the educators will be most challenging. If it does not start in early ages, in our inner circles, in the homes especially, then the task of educators is very challenging. Good education must not be one of the options. It is indeed our hope for any future life, personal and collective. There is no plan B. Life with no education leaves us at the jungle level. And educating for a future of peace is naturally an aspect of good education. If education will not lead to peace or increase the potential for peace, then it is no education. And when I say education, I do not merely mean a curriculum in an institution, but the whole lifestyle, a mindset, a value system, a model of relationships and attitude, as well as concrete programs. 
before moving on with the details, further details, let me clarify that something called peace education, like nature-friendly education or others, may be branding techniques in schools. We have them in Lebanon as well. So I, I personally avoid favoring any particular, particular model of peace education. Now about some of what I consider critical in any effort to educate people for peace. It is a long, ongoing, and multi-generational process, not a decision by internal powers in a country or an external decision, influence, or precondition. I say this in order to dismiss the political use of peace as a, as a decision to be negotiated superficially or on the grounds of passing interest. You know what I have in mind? That this or that country will broker peace, a peace agreement in a distant land after one meeting or two or three or five or by pressure or this and that. Those are temporary styles of peace. This is a simplistic approach to peace. Education, educating people for peace also refers to value systems. What values? This is not a secret. I'm not, giving a, I'm not giving you big news, but there are values, my friends, such as respect, service, self and other awareness, self-critique, creativity, kindness, social cohesion, team spirit, empathy. These are notions, ideas that are foundational in good education, which are part of peace education that would shape the personality of individuals and be safeguarded by society and its systems and institutions. Education for peace is also knowledge-based and does not exist in vacuum. It is knowledge about history, diversity and the other, and it is knowledge on external and internal models of harmonious and gentle living. Ignorant peace is temporary peace and the peace of the ignorant, at some level, is bondage to the other. It requires, peace education requires the development of skills, behaviors, and therefore needs training, formal, informal. It's, it needs to be rehearsed somewhere, preferably at home, classroom, neighborhood, work, so that it may be implemented very widely. One cannot objectify peace and its education as it is influenced by something called inner tranquility and inner peace. While grown from within the person's mind and soul, it moves on to peace with those of one's group and of one's kind and hopefully into the outer cir circles of peace with those of different types or opinions, etc. There may be obstacles in our effort to educate for peace. Education for peace may be undermined by establishments or the partial implementation of constitutions that create lack of harmony or lack of fairness, lack of freedoms. Peace always implies interconnectedness. So any self-centeredness may stand in the way. Educational curricula, which are heavily influenced or controlled by political choices or platforms are also a problem. Because often when we think about peace, we have a model of peace or a solution for peace that fits our political agenda. And that's not what I mean by peace. Uh, I, will not, uh, I will not refer to the problem of history, but I should here mention that the more you read about your history, others' history, ancient history, formal history, the more you will doubt the precision of the truths that are presented in those histories, and these may also stand in the way of peace education. Another major problem in peace education or hindrance is the following, that th there are too many identities that are based on fear. This was mentioned in a previous session. Too many identities that are based on fear, victimization, perception or awareness of existential threat, whether historically or objectively verified or not. So each group finds more common ground in the experience and history of animosity than in anything else. Law, citizenship, common destiny, future hope. Each group may focus on some aspect 
some period, some episode of history, whether tragic or victorious, and might shape its ethos or identity upon that. In fact, much also depends on when a group determines its history started or when its victimization started. So this has no end. And peace has no chance if all these hindrances are in place. Now let me be constructive. For peaceful societies to be promoted and developed, instincts need, need to be disciplined. Instincts need to be disciplined as part of personality development, as formal education, and as implementation of law and order. If you allow instincts to go wild, every human being, to varying degrees, will go wild, and the instinct will often win against everything else. We should realize that the opposite of terror is things like comforting, harmony, the freedom of self-critique, multidisciplinary approaches, and so on. Priority has to go to the fact that the guns of all sorts have to stop. Guns of all types have to stop. Otherwise, education for peace will have no chance. Education will remain hostage. And values and spirituality and other important matters will go into a moratorium for things to quiet down and priorities to be set up in a different way. Education cannot guarantee peace as such, but it can counter such conditions as poverty, radicalism, illiteracy, ignorance, isolation, uncritical living. It can create respect, humility, and appreciate personal dignity. The way to promote peace in one area is also different from another area. So there is no one global technique for promoting peace or educating for peace, even though some of the values I mentioned above will be valid no matter where you go and whenever, where, whenever it may be. Therefore, specialized and localized approaches are also necessary among us. Let me come to my final part. Peace building as strategy is not a response to war, nor can it readily stop wars. It is training for development for harmony, creativity, and life in fullness as we, be, we believe God intended for us. In this realm, we should learn to work for the peace of our neighbors as well. <coughs> Not our peace only. The peace of our neighbors, the peace of our enemies, as we are to benefit when others are in peace within their systems, and our chances to have peace with them will certainly increase. Yes, with proper education for peace at home, school, university, elsewhere, we will participate in the transformation of the world. Now, in our university, a few words about Haigazian University. The Haigazian University model includes points that I would like to share. In our Christian Muslim university community, the following have been the most basic approaches for living and learning together. Maybe these have been our tacit curriculum for peace. I've listed four points. No one knows about these, by the way. These are not written anywhere. But I know these are there. And it's like a tacit curriculum. Why these Muslims and Christians on our campus are living peacefully? I cannot be simpler than the following. The following are the values, let's say. First, as you come from different faiths, Christian, Muslim in that case, we tell the students, learn from each other and learn about each other. This is the first very fundamental point. You come from different faiths, learn from each other and learn about each other. Number two, respect each other. Number three, learn to, to work together in teams, large or small. Learn to work together in teams large or small. And fourth, practice the service of your societies together while you are on campus. Practice the service of your societies together while you're on campus. These four points have been probably one of the most 
important parts of our university culture. My dear friends, let us help the generations who learn daily to search for the enemy. Let us help them to first seek to build good bridges. As a child, my toys of choice were matchbox cars, small cars, metallic. So we lived in a church school campus, so I had a whole campus, a garden, a yard, lots of options. I loved building roads, building places where I could play with this. I probably had almost 100 cars, matchbox cars. So I was, I was you know, endowed, well endowed. So I loved doing things with these cars. What can you do with these cars? I loved, and I had the space, building roads with cement, soil, water, anything that I could find. Once in a while, I went to the challenge of building miniature bridges in our garden. When I say miniature, I mean like this size, guard, bridges. I also did parking lots for my cars. <laughs> the parking lots were the easiest. The more rewarding and difficult part was building bridges that could hold for some time. Education for peace, not parking lots, but roads and bridges. Thank you. That was really excellent. So good evening, everyone. And I'd like to add my gratitude to the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning, to the faculty and staff that comprise the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University Peace Studies Department, to Reverend Dr. Hadotsian and Hagaisian University for this very powerful and engaging gathering. And I'd like to extend a special thank you to Ron Pagnuco and John Merkel for the invitation to present this evening. I think you'll find that the synergy between our remarks is somewhat overwhelming. So I actually want to begin um, in my childhood as well. When I was a child, church was a place of unspeakable joy. Weekday evenings held Bible study or prayer and worship service. It was a midweek respite for the soul a haven from the daily onslaught and pressures of life. Sunday mornings, which always felt to me like a holiday, brought a wonderful procession of people. Freshly washed cars would be lined up outside the church as cleanliness was next to godliness. A parade of church hats, hand-stitched dresses, threadbare but fine suits reflected that the material best of the community was reserved for the worship of the Lord. Lavish midday meals were prepared and ready to be returned to and communally shared that afternoon. Candy and tissues were stuffed into purses and quarters were pressed into palms for the offering. I so looked forward to the day when I would have quiet money a dollar bill that I could put into the plate. Sunday morning was a visible manifestation of care, pride, and faith in God. Internally, joy, hope, and courage also entered into this space. While daily life may have held fear, anger, and systematic desecration of a common humanity, church was the antithesis to the reality of the day. It was a place where I could see others, their strength, their passion, their humanity, and likewise, I could be seen. A place where we were not defined by material wealth, nor by the standards of a system to which we had limited access. A place where none of us were viewed as less than it was a place where our humanity and the divine were united into one and all reflected the image of God. It was, without equivocation, 
a place of peace. And I imagine that the solace of peace is what members of the Tree of Life community sought on Saturday morning when they walked into the synagogue. The peace of seeing another with shared experience. The peace of having one's humanity recognized. The peace of divine encounter. The peace of respite from a trying world as Jewish communities in the United States are subject to half of the anti-religious hate crimes in our country, a number that's seen a 60% increase in the past year. People gathered on Saturday morning to seek peace, and they found hatred and violence and injustice. Just 48 hours before what is thought to be the deadliest attack on the Jewish community in the United States, a hate crime took place in Kentucky as the shooter killed two African Americans at a local grocery store. This location was, according to reports, his second choice. His initial chosen location was the First Baptist Church in Jefferson Town, Kentucky, where he wrestled to get into the door, but it was locked. It was a church where people had gathered earlier in the day for prayer. It was only 90 minutes that separated the peaceful prayer of the church community and this terrorist. Or annually, mosques and synagogues are forced to engage and worship under the protective gaze of police and homeland security because of the number of credible threats against their seeking of peace. Now to be clear, attacking religious communities is not new in the United States. In the last decade alone, we've witnessed the murders at two Jewish community centers in Overland Park, Kansas in 2014, leaving three people dead. 2012 brought the murder of six in the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin. In 2008, we saw the Tennessee Valley Universalist Unitarian shootings, which left two dead. In a particularly painful scenario, in 2015, nine members of the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, were killed during a prayer service. And I say particularly painful because this prayerful community had invited Dylan Roof, the person who would later murder them, to come in. They had prayed with him, had sought to help him find peace before he killed them. But perhaps the best known church-related massacre is the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. On September 15, 1963, members of the KKK planted a bomb that killed four little girls who were playing together during church services in the basement. The church had been a hotbed of activity, promoting peace, justice, humanity, and restoration. It was a place that not only promoted peace for worshipers, but that sought to spread peace throughout the nation. I begin with this somewhat saddening, disheartening, disappointing, fearful news, because to have a conversation about inclusive peace building demands a conversation about religion. For those who seek to terrorize and sow discord and hate, religion has often been used as a convenient and hurtful cover. For example, during Eid al-Adha this year in Minnesota, while 30,000 people from many traditions gathered in U.S. Bank Stadium to celebrate unity and promote the common good, Others tried to label the organizers as terrorists and sow seeds of fear and doubt. So any of us engaged in or supportive of the work of peace must acknowledge the powerful role peace building can play, a role religion can play in the peace building effort. We also have to recognize the disproportionate pain that faith communities experience in the work towards peace. But we cannot end our peace-building conversation with religious communities. Rather, educational institutions also have a uniquely compelling role to play in the work of peace-building. 
a role that begins with our educative mission, but that extends beyond it into interfaith dialogue in order to truly pursue peace. So today I will talk about why and how educational institutions must engage in the work of peace building, describe the importance of interfaith education as part of peace building, and explore some emerging best practices in this area and end with a call to action for all of us. One thing we know is that most conflicts around the globe, including in the US, reflect what some might call tribal disputes or tribalism. And the tribe may be defined based on race, ethnicity, economic class, religion, politics, gender, language, sexual orientation, or other human-made boundaries. Chaos, war, and other conflicts erupt when tribes find themselves competing for resources or power and view the other, the other, as an obstacle to their prosperity. Today, we see this tribalism playing out in nearly every corner of our globe. Domestically, we see intergroup dialogue within the United States increasingly polarized. This separation of people and retreat into corners is both a precursor to and symbol of tribalism. We tune into the news or radio station with which we are predisposed to agree. We see updates only from people and outlets we have already liked on social media. It is therefore entirely possible to isolate ourselves to the extent that we believe everyone does and should think and often look like us. For example, and as a result, according to a 2013 Reuters poll, about 40% of white Americans and about 25% of non-white Americans are surrounded exclusively by friends of their own race. There is data citing numbers as high as 75% as having racially exclusive friendships. So when we talk about the other side or the other tribe, however you define the other side as our opposite, and yet we've never taken the time to hear or learn their perspective. They, and whomever you want to define as they, have likely not done the same. This critical divide, this isolation, is a facilitator of division and a significant barrier to dialogue. It's a significant barrier to peace. Like Reverend Dr. Hadotsian, I believe we are at a critical juncture in higher education and we need to respond. We have a tremendous opportunity to craft a community that stands counter to the prevailing tribalism of the day. And as educators, we seriously have to ask ourselves whether our mission is to perpetuate social norms and the status quo or to challenge ourselves by striving for a different reality on our campuses and for our students? Is it not our educative work to explore and dismantle these divisions in support of thriving for all? I believe it's here that education can play a critical role in promoting, maintaining, and sustaining peace. It's well documented that, as Smith writes, quote, education is perhaps the most important tool for human development and the eradication of poverty. It is the means by which successive generations develop the values, knowledge, and skills for personal health and safety and for future political, economic, social, and cultural development, end quote. Education directly addresses those factors that inhibit and limit peace. And in our US context, we know that education has long been the greatest force to dismantling injustice, to opening up opportunity, and to crafting a way forward in even the most desperate of times. We know it's been dispensed unevenly and unjustly and sometimes withheld to the social, personal, and economic peril of those impacted. And for reasons we are all familiar with in this room, we know that key issues of educational inequity in America have centered around issues of race and class. That these are the entry points for lack of peace, 
provides a clear rationale for the importance and power of education in building peaceful communities. In 1947, Harry Truman wrote, if the ladder of educational opportunity rises high at the doors of some youth and scarcely rises at the doors of others, while at the same time formal education is made a prerequisite to occupational and social advance, then education may become the means not of eliminating race and class distinctions, but of deepening and solidifying them. So clearly, educational communities have a unique opportunity to respond to those factors that promote peace and social advance. The work of peace, inclusion, and justice is at the heart of education. And yet we cannot do this work without considering religious diversity as a critical part of our inclusion work. In July 2018 at Liberal Arts Illuminated, Noah Silverman from Interfaith Youth Corps challenged us to ask if our inclusion work acknowledges the power and importance of interfaith dialogue and religious diversity. Specifically, he asked, does our conversation around inclusive excellence and diversity include religious diversity? And does our institution, top to bottom, support its students to live and express their religious or non-religious lives freely on our campus? And until we can affirmatively answer those questions, our work will not be done. Therefore, for education to be most effective in this work, it's imperative that we engage in interfaith dialogue to promote peace. And we know that, quote, paying attention to religion is not at all a matter of imposing faith or morality on anyone, write Douglas and Rhonda Jacobson. It's a matter of responding intelligently to the questions of life that students find themselves necessarily asking, end quote to fulfill our educative duty to the students that surround us, that we have the privilege of serving, demands that we encounter interfaith work. Yet we also know that our work is larger than even the individual students we have the privilege of serving. Our work is in service to the democracy within which we dwell. In his new book, Out of Many Faiths, Religious Diversity and the American Promise, Ibu Patel, founder of Interfaith Youth Corps, writes, if American democracy depends on the vibrancy of our civic life, and if our civic life depends at least in part on the contributions of religious communities, then it would seem self-evident that facilitating such participation in a compelling, is, in a, is a compelling interest for American democracy, end quote. I would add that education is central to democracy, and therefore education is essential to peace building, done in partnership with religious communities and interfaith dialogue. I believe we are called to this active interfaith work at St. Ben's and St. John's, and it is not new work for our communities. For example, Mother Benedicta Reap was unwavering in her commitment to instruct young women and spread the Benedictine values to support the common good. Then and now, creating a more just, peaceful, and compassionate world is critical to our work of supporting the common good by addressing structural inequalities. We have long been involved in this work of social justice and of peace building. It's the mission upon which we are founded, a mission we are recalled to each and every day. With history on our side, we can reflect the call found in leadership practices for interfaith excellence in higher education, a call that suggests American college campuses have long set the educational and civic agenda for the nation. We are social laboratories where strategies can be tested where faculty can help create the necessary knowledge base to support and guide interfaith engagement, end quote. This work of interfaith dialogue and the work of peace building is the work of education. But as Dr. Hadotsian said, simply providing programs is not enough. 
we know that to consider the structural work of injustice to actively build peace, we have to begin to look at structures that support inequity, chaos, and disharmony in our society. I will use an example that no one will be surprised by. Our structural work at St. Ben's and St. John's is being implemented through one particular initiative, Becoming Community. This inclusion and justice-oriented initiative will intentionally undertake a practice of ongoing community formation based on transformative inclusion. Our goal is to prepare students, faculty, staff, and administrators to become agents of change, or agents of peace, if you will, by preparing us to dismantle oppression rather than simply learning about oppression. We seek to make a substantive shift from the narrative of critique to the narrative of action, a structural shift to peace building. We will continue to endeavor to move our institutions into an intersection of fields as has been described throughout this day. And we will have opportunities to work with local community partners, including religious partners, to ensure that our impact and our learnings extend well beyond our campuses. Drawing directly on the work of Patel, Baxter, and Silverman, we find nine best practices that I would ask you to hold us accountable to as a community as we engage in the structural work to promote peace building. One, and this is directly from their work, we need to establish links to institutional identity and mission. It's essential that interfaith cooperation be a priority and directly linked to our institution's mission, values, and identity. Two, we need a campus-wide strategy. An individual plan for promoting interfaith engagement of necessity must flow from its mission and guide the campus across the curriculum and the co-curriculum. Three, can we create a public identity, a public statement that reflects our internal strategy, where materials are used to highlight interfaith initiatives and represent people from a variety of religious backgrounds? Four, are we respecting and accommodating diverse religious identities? So how do we ensure that programming rests on both respect for the religious or non-religious identity of all members of the community, and we provide accommodations for individuals to live out their traditions in daily life? Five, are we making interfaith cooperation an academic priority? And we know that increasingly scholars from a variety of disciplines are recognizing the importance of interfaith cooperation as a subject of research, analysis, and instruction. Six, it's essential we build competence and capacity among staff and faculty who will do much to shape the campus climate and student experience. Seven, we have to encourage student leadership. They write that higher education movements lack legs if students are not committed or invested, and young interfaith leaders do not emerge unless they have civic spaces within which to develop. Eight, we need campus and community partnerships. We need effective engagement in addition to theoretical knowledge. And nine, we have to assess campus climates and interfaith initiatives to determine outcomes, goals, best practices, and efficacy. For us, the question is how do we ensure we are addressing each of these elements as we do our work? That is a part of our peace building call. But I'd like to leave with a call to action. As I worked on these remarks, I continually returned to two things. First, I had to intentionally wrestle with whether peace building had room and space for disagreement, discomfort, and possibly anger. How do we ask the systematically disenfranchised to not be angry when engaging in peace building, an activity that will not only demand more for them, but place them at greater risk in the process. I had to wrestle with how do we on college campuses fulfill our educative and democracy missions while allowing the space to hear the courageous voices of those who were hurt. How do we hear and embrace all voices for the sake of peace? 
even when those voices take us to places of discomfort with our status quo. As we build peace, we also have to build a space to hear fear, anger, and courage. The other element that I kept finding myself returning to was the opening image of my childhood church, a place of sights and sounds, values and traditions that shaped who I am. And I know that people of every religious background have convictions and commitments that are defining for them. As such, I think it's imperative that I be clear that interfaith dialogue and education towards peace building is not a call to abandoning those convictions. It's a call to utilizing them for the common good. As Ibu Patel writes, if the challenge of the diverse society is to embrace its differences and maintain a common life, the challenge of the particular religious community is to embrace the nation's common life while maintaining its difference. But I couldn't get those sights and sounds from many decades ago out of my mind. I could not temper my anger that 11 people are now dead when all they sought was peace on Saturday. I felt a surge of disgust recalling all the other moments when sacred space has been defiled. I felt at a loss. I too felt disappointed with human nature and I needed restorative hope. Your homiletics professor will disagree mightily with what I'm about to say. But as I found myself in such dire need of hope, I wondered how I could reconcile the reality of life and the anguish I've been feeling in, internally. And then I remembered the words of Alice Walker, words that were sent to me once again this morning. The more I wonder, the more I love. I wonder how humans can destroy one another. I wonder how we can intentionally sow hatred. And with each of these wonderings, I knew that I was being challenged and called to love more deeply, to see more clearly, not to deny my frustration, but to choose to answer it with love to choose to answer it with peace, to choose to answer with compassion for others and for myself, to choose love. So for each of you here tonight, if you are feeling hurt, if you are finding your hope wavering, if you are finding your frustration mounting, I hope that you too choose love. Thank you. Thank you, President Hodostian and President Hinton for your remarks. I return to my original comment. I think there was some hope in there for all of us. Um, and now we have time for questions. I'm happy to take questions if you've got cards that will be collected and brought up here. But if you have questions you'd like to ask by going to the, to the microphones, that would be great as well. But maybe I'll take my prerogative as the moderator to ask uh, the first couple questions. Um, President Hodostin, you, you talked about in your youth being disappointed with human nature. It sounded, as I heard you talk, like you had maybe moved beyond that disappointment um, and came to recognize grace in human nature as well. Can you say a little more about how you moved to that point for some of the audience that might be looking to find that grace? Yeah, thank you. Um, I wonder why, at an early age, I came to the realization that uh, there was a problem with human nature as such. And as I, and let me repeat, I'm grateful that I didn't pick and choose groups or individuals who would be guilty or who would be my enemy. I'm really grateful for that. Now, what sustained us and what sustained me and the grace part? I, I just hinted 
very, very simply to the fact that um, the family played a major role. Um, we know in developmental psychology that um, the love we can give to a child can sustain them in very difficult conditions. Which doesn't mean that someone who did not receive love as a child <coughs> will never see grace. They will. But then we have an easier way in the most tragic situations. So I re re-emphasize that one. But, um, but I think, um, and let me, let me give a small testimony here about the grace part. And the reason why I am, why I was called to the ministry myself. Uh, during that same war, uh, my parents um, had almost zero resources financially. And it was a very difficult time for us as teenagers, my sister and I, to witness my parents in a besieged city with no finances. And yet we saw them happily serving others, singing, praying, playing. Uh, our house, the pastor's house, my father was also a pastor, was a place of refuge for many people who were, who were afraid. Um, and yet we saw the joy in them. That was probably the most important point of grace, which personally led me to faith and, and actually call to the ministry. So I think that's sufficiently said there. Thank you. Thank you. President Hinton, at the risk of looking like I'm throwing you a softball, um, obviously we are in a Benedictine community here. Um, can you say a little bit about how our Benedictine ethos can help us achieve the nine goals you articulated at the end of your talk as we think about educating for peace? I think one of the great parts about our community, and it is a privilege being in a Catholic and Benedictine community, is that we recognize and support the development of the whole person. It's not, not sure. I always think people can hear me yelling when I use right. my kindergarten teacher voice. Um, one of the great advantages of being in this community and that we are called to in part because of our Catholic and Benedictine heritage is that we have to attend holistically to the development of young women and young men. We don't say, well, we're here and invested in your academic life, but your social life doesn't matter. Or we're here and invested in the collection of courses that you take, but we don't have a call to help you make sense of those courses and connect those dots. Or how you behave in class matters, but how you act to your neighbor in the residence hall doesn't. Rather, we have a holistic approach to education in our community. And if you take those nine points together, what they're describing is a holistic approach to interfaith development, an approach that says, make sure that your internal strategy and your external strategy are aligned. If you're talking about the importance of interfaith dialogue in the classroom, talk about it in the residence hall. It's a holistic approach to teaching and learning and being in community. And because our Catholic and Benedictine heritage places us in intentional community, I think it's very easy for us to measure ourselves by, but never take for granted our alignment with those nine principles. Thank you. I didn't mean to imply it was a simple question. Thank you. Great answer. Other questions, observations, comments? Vincent. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, presidents all for your wonderful contributions tonight and, and for the, your two wonderful lectures. Um, I think we can all agree that the, at the present time uh, in this country, uh, but this is also reflected in other parts of the world, there's a massive um, polarization, um, especially of uh, political views, but this also uh, manifests itself in um, religious polarization, social polarization, economic polarization. Um, and both of you in different ways tonight in your um, remarks um, uh, indicated that one of the, pr the well, the, the, the really the solution towards peace building is education. Um, 
and I think we can all agree that to some extent, somebody said this at dinner tonight, and I thought it was a very wise um, thought, uh, to some extent maybe the, the present polarization is a result of a failure of education. Mm -hmm. um, so that b brings me to the point, well, how do we then solve this? And, and I'm reminded that, that um, you know, to take a couple of pretty dramatic examples, uh, both Jesus and in far more recent times Martin Luther King Jr. were peace builders, but they were also very confrontative figures. They had the courage to, to so to speak, to, to stand up against um, the prevailing powers at great ex expense of themselves. And both, in fact, both of them, in fact, were killed for their, for their efforts. Obviously, we want to be peace builders and therefore not to, in any sense, spread hate or, or divisiveness. But don't we, in some way, have to um, confront the injustice which denies education to some people? Confront the injustice which, um, which uh, multiplies poverty? Uh, confront so many of the injustices of our world. How do we do that confrontative task uh, against injustice, against those who are, who are not building peace, while at the same time ourselves being peace builders? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, let me start a non-American response to this because there's lots of American material in, in what you said, obviously. But there are some general issues. I'm afraid, and, and I agree that the failure of education is somewhere there, globally so. Maybe also in the USA, but globally so. But I would say that part of the failure of education is because educators or institutions um, theorize sidedness, one-sidedness. That is, we're usually intelligent people, usually. And we know how to turn um, one pole into a theory versus another pole. I think it's very challenging for uh, academia, for the academia, to try to balance the varieties of the realities that are out there in society and that parts, pockets of truth here and there, to try to put them all together, we fail. And then when we fail, then our students are getting uh, shortchanged or uh, less than what we are supposed to give. This I say from a Lebanese perspective, from a Middle Eastern perspective. And then when we become hostage, while theorizing, while sounding academic, hostage to a certain reality or a sidedness, um, then it doesn't strengthen us or empower us to confront real types of evil or injustice and so on, because we know within ourselves that we are limited in our approach. I don't know if, if, if you understood. I mean, I'm implying a number of things there, uh, but let me stop there. Um, thank you for your question, Vincent. So, and I'm going to have to look at my notes. I wrote almost another speech in response to your question here. I, I don't know if I would say, I, I'm not ready to buy the word failure at this moment. The rampant misuse of education I'm very comfortable with. Um, and I think there are three or four things that's happened in education that has yielded this polarization. One, we've made education highly individualized. At one point, education was a public good that all had access to, and now it's a highly individualized endeavor. I've got mine. Good luck to you getting yours. Um, and so I think that individualization is really problematic. Um, I don't know that education led that or is a victim of it, but I know we've not done enough to confront it, to use your language. Second, I think education is largely viewed as an end to an economic mean. You go and you get an education so that you are better off than your family, your, your parents were. So there's this economic component. Again, not, not touching on the moral justice sort of pieces of education that, that some of us believe it's for. And then it's making education a commodity. 
It's the commodification of education that's problematic. Within that, and this is a whole diff other speech, but it's interesting to me that with the democratization of education, these things happen. So as people who had historically not had access suddenly have access, we've moved away from the public good, from the larger value, from making it about communal to who can afford it and who can't afford it. Um, I think in terms of when and whether we're willing to confront at, you know, what's happening in education. I think for some people, it, we're confronting it all the time. It may not be in the ways that you might see in a, in a civil rights movement, but there's confrontation at, of it each day when you try to fix the economic model, when you try to ensure that students have financial access, access you're confronting it. But ultimately, I think w the biggest confrontation will be when, when we, the professional community on campuses, are willing to be uncomfortable with what we see. I, you've heard me say before, likely, and I'll say again, too long we've hoped to work out these issues of inequity on the backs of students, I think. We've expected through programming they would do better. I think the burden is on us to do better. Um, and we have to begin to do that, and it will involve discomfort. So maybe it's confronting ourselves, it's confronting our own will for structural change, our own will to challenge inequity is what's needed first and foremost. We really have time, unfortunately, for basically one more question. Anyone want to? I wouldn't say have the last word. That makes it a little bit too heavy. But uh, a student, great. Please. Thank you for um, all your time tonight that you've shared with us, but I wanted to talk to something that's a little bit more close to home for here. Um, so how do we at CSB SJU um, fail at inclusion and interfaith dialogue? And then what can we, and what can I do as a student to combat this in my everyday life? That's an excellent question, and I'm grateful for your willingness to own it. Again, I'm going to back away from the word failure. It's not, it's not a word I, I like. I don't think we fail. I think there's more we can do. I think we can intentionally see, recognize, and support um, different religious perspectives on our campus and invite and engage those conversations. What can you do? You can Talk to someone you've not spoken to before and engage informally. You can be an ally to people who may have a different faith than you or who have no faith and help create a space where they feel comfortable expressing their beliefs. You can um, take a class and think about what are the implications of what you're hearing in that class for interfaith dialogue. You can participate in events like this and go to bed hopeful that you can make a difference. Because I do believe that every single student, every faculty member, staff member, and administrator can make a difference in our success. But I would never say start from a position of failure. Start from a position of here's what I want to see happen in these communities. Begin from that asset perspective and then work towards that end accordingly and seek out people who are willing to do that work with you I think you'll find more people on the campuses who are willing to support you in that work than you might think. On that note, mm -hmm. start from a position of hope. Thank you all for coming out tonight, for participating in the conversation. Thanks to all who helped put on this event over the course of the day. Have a good evening. Thank you.